Considering the enormous economic dislocation which the war operations have caused in the regions where the campaign is raging, there seems to be very little corresponding disturbance of the bird life of the same districts. Hey, do you hear? We're going back into the line. Sergeant says anyway. Yes. Good. The rattle and rumble of transport, the constant coming and going of bodies of troops, the deafening explosions of artillery, the night-long flare and flicker of star shells have not sufficed to scare the local birds away from their chosen feeding grounds. I had a plan, or perhaps one might say, a dream. Enough of the hurly-burly. After the war, I would remove to a property in Siberia to live where wolves can be heard, but the clamor of man is dimmed. A simple dwelling, a couple of local lads as servants. It wasn't an entirely unpractical idea. I knew the country, I spoke the language. I could see absolutely clearly just how it would be. Ah oh, well, man proposes, but God disposes. Put that bloody cigarette out, you... <laughs> Many readers of the Morning Post will especially grieve to learn of the death of Lance Sergeant Hector H. Munro, known better perhaps under his pen name of Saki. Mr. Munro, who was 45 years of age at the time of his death, enlisted at the very beginning of the war. A few Amongst later, Saki's most notable writings were his Westminster Alice, Reginald, The Chronicles of Clovis, and the Beasts. Mr. Munro was not only a gifted writer, but a delightful companion. His conversation was as entertaining as his writing. So there we are, killed by a cliché. And I did so hate clichés. Saki is the godfather of modern British comedy. I think of Bovell, he's best known as the chronicler of the Edwardian age. He has a wonderful facility with words. He has a gift to say in a sentence something that you hadn't thought of, but sums up where he's come from, where he is, and clearly where he's going. Saki's world has sexuality in it, albeit covered. Saki's world has this, you know, dark force in it. Saki's world is shape-shifting. He also influenced a number of major writers who came after him, most notably Noel Coward, who acknowledges the debt to him, but I think also P.G. Woodhouse and a number of other satirists and comedians in the English tradition. It's just really, really funny. I never gave interviews, ever, except for when my publishers asked me to do one for their new Bodleian magazine in 1911. The interview of a lifetime, therefore, it was, given with great reluctance. I hope, uh, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. No, not at all, Mr. Munro. Did you have far to come? No, I, uh, uh, in any case, I took a cab. Cigarette? No, thank you, I, uh, I don't. I, I have you been writing long? Uh, uh, no, I, uh, no. So, do you know anything about interviewing? No. Well, I don't either. Mr. Munro smoked in the leisurely way of one who is performing one of life's great functions. To look at, he is what nice old ladies would call interesting. He's very slim and straight and well-groomed. His eyes are shadowed mysteriously. His mouth has ironic curves, and there is a delicate lack of energy about his movements that is rather charming. So he is an excellently worthy companion, withal studiously and unobtrusively observant. But the personality of the man is frankly baffling, and he declines to talk about himself. In fact, there ensued a silence of what seemed to be an hour and a half. Hmm, that's it, you see. If I'm a shadowy figure, it's through choice. And if I ever chose to break that silence, where would I begin? With a story, one could start anywhere, but when it is a life story... I was born in the Burma of 1870, when my father was Inspector General of Police. That's Burma. And, um, miles and miles away in England is Devon. It would have been here, or very near here anyway, that my mother was run over by a cow and died. 
It is sad to relate, though no one could deny there is amusement in the tale, that she had been sent here by my father for her safety while pregnant with her fourth child. And there we are, the three of us. The fourth person is Muriel, Charlie's wife. That's Charlie there, Ethel, dear Ethel, of whom more later. And that's, um, that's me, the youngest. My father now had a decision to make. He gave us into the care of maiden aunts, his sisters, Aunt Augusta and Aunt Charlotte, the latter known as Aunt Tom. To them, children were untrustworthy mysteries, as alien as wild animals. Little beasts, one might say. When you look at Saki's life, obviously his father, the military background, all of that was important. But the defining character came from his aunts. His aunts, by certainly his opinion, and also the opinion of his sister, Ethel, who, who uh, wrote about them in her short biography of her brother, um, were not very nice women. Uh, I mean, they, they were the, the, the typical overbearing, ageing, childless aunt who wouldn't uh, allow kids to be kids. You can certainly see the figure of aunts or other powerful older women throughout the stories and the novels. A typical example of this is the short story called The Lumber Room. Nicholas, the, the hero, is a typical Saki child. He's inquisitive, he's rebellious, he's daring, he's against authority, and above all, he's imaginative. He's confined to a house for a minor misdeed. He actually puts a frog in his wholesome bowl of, of bread and milk. And for this, he's punished for his depravity. And while he's at home, he's supposed to be indoors, being good, uh, being seen but not heard, as Victorian and Edwardian children were supposed to be. And he finds his way up to a lumber room. The key turns stiffly in the lock but it turned. The door opened and Nicholas was in an unknown land compared with which the Gooseberry Garden was a stale delight, a mere material pleasure. And for just one moment, one magical afternoon, Nicholas is able to get into a magical room full of storybooks and old toys and his inner world comes outside and comes alive. The aunt thinks that Nicholas will have gone into the fruit gardens to raid the raspberry canes and goes looking for him there. The aunt falls into a rainwater tank and can't get out. Nicholas! And there's a wonderful Nicholas. scene where he pretends not to know it's the aunt and turns the tables on her in a very Sarkian way. Fetch the little ladder from under the cherry tree. I was told I wasn't to go into the gooseberry garden, said Nicholas promptly. I told you not to, and now I tell you that you may, came the voice from the rainwater tank, rather impatiently. Your voice doesn't sound like aunt's, objected Nicholas. You may be the evil one, tempting me to be disobedient. Aunt often tells me that the evil one tempts me and that I always yield. This time, I'm not going to yield. I like the way, you know, often the, the, the stories actually start in the middle. You know, there's no, again, and that's about the economy as well, that, you know, it assumes that you understand the, the milieu in which, you know, in which they're set. So they bang you right in there. There's no setup. There's no extraneous detail of any kind. Some aunts deserve worse, and get it, as in Shredni Vashtar. Conradin was ten years old, and the doctor had pronounced his professional opinion that the boy would not live another five years. Mrs. de Rop would never, in her honestest moments, have confessed to herself that she disliked Conradin, though she might have been dimly aware that thwarting him for his good was a duty which she did not find particularly irksome. In the dull, cheerless garden, overlooked by so many windows that were ready to open with a message not to do this or that, or a reminder that medicines were due, he found little attraction. And right at the back of this overgrown garden, there's a woodshed. 
He becomes very attached to a Houdan hen, as we know Hector Munro did when he was a child, and she seeks it out and has it taken away. She suspects that he has another pet hidden away in a tool shed, and, and indeed he does, the great polecat ferret Shredni Vashtar. Which is a wonderful name, but all it means in Russian is the middle of the river Vashtar. It doesn't mean anything, it just sounds glorious. And this animal starts to take on a deific role in this little boy's life. He actually goes to worship it. He goes to leave little sacrificial items with it. What are you keeping in that locked hutch? She asked. I believe it's guinea pigs. I'll have them all cleared away. In the shed that evening, there was an innovation in the worship of the hutch god. Conradin had been wont to chant his praises. Tonight, he asked a boon. And there's this awful episode where the boy starts to pray, do this one thing for me, Shredni Vashtar, and he watches as the aunt goes down to the woodshed. Shredni Vashtar went forth. His thoughts were red thoughts and his teeth were white. His enemies called the peace, but he brought them death. And the animal takes her by the throat and kills her. And then the maid is screaming, what are we going to tell the little boy? What are we going to tell the little boy? And there he is, helping himself to an extra slice of toast in the kitchen. It really is a very eerie story. You know, what Saki grasps is that children are very savage creatures. And beyond that, it's not just children, it's, it's humans really, are very savage creatures. The Edwardian period was a period when censorship was, was in one level rock hard, and yet here you have this story that, as it were, gets under the radar. And it gets under the radar partly because he puts that judgment of humanity onto a child, the flip side of this over-sentimentalization of children, which is that children are of no account. I think the thing that people find hard to take in Saki and tends to fire, I think, rather lamely into an accusation of misogyny is his unabashed dislike of small children and a kind of venom directed towards the family unit. And, and perhaps that gets interpreted as a sort of misogyny. But, you know, again, to defend him, as I feel I must, I think, you know, you've got to bear in mind that, that, that there was a kind of sickly sentimentality about that kind of familial setup at that time. It wasn't just a kind of endorsement of it as the right way to live and the right way to bring up children. It was a kind of propagandized sentimentality. And I think he's fully uh, legitimate in, in taking a pop at that. Aunts occur a lot in your stories. Mm. And in stories, one can torture them with impunity. It's harder in life. I had a bizarre time once taking an aunt to Edinburgh. My aunt Charlotte, it was. I, I have the whiff of a, a story in my nose. Uncomfortable. No, well, this was more of a nightmare, albeit a comic one, naturally. <laughs> Whenever we changed trains, she insisted the railway company bring her her luggage on a tray to show they still had her cases. And then we did arrive one short after all. Having recovered it, I was dragged back and forth all across the city looking for a hotel she might like. Anyhow, she told me, we are seeing Edinburgh. The consolation much the same as Moses informing the companions of his 40 years wandering that they were seeing Egypt. At last we came to a place she thought she might like, but she only agreed to stay after scolding the manageress and the servants out of their senses. I found myself comforting two chambermaids in the boots who were crying quietly in corners. And when I came back, after having a shave and a wash, my aunt was beaming on the entire establishment. You see, you can easily manage these people, she remarked at lunch, if you only know the way to their hearts. We later went on to stay in rooms. The hotel people earnestly recommended a lot to us. We didn't go anywhere when we were children. And I didn't do much writing. I preferred to draw. But I loved the works of Lewis Carroll and read and reread Alice's adventures. Eventually, I was to take her to Westminster. It was Alice herself who opened a small door onto the world of writing. But that comes later. Between the three of us at Broadgate Villa, Charlie, Ethel and me, 
was a bond strengthened by adversity. We had our own world there. This was exploded for me when I went to board at Bedford Grammar School. Something of a shock to the system after the care of governesses. But, as I've always said, you can't expect a boy to be vicious until he's been to a good school. It was the kind of place to which minor officers of empire, living abroad in mud huts, dispatch their offspring to learn the values and traditions that will take them to far-off mud dwellings of their own. And God, of course, approved. I was finally liberated from aunts and from school when my father returned to England. He was better than Alice's white knight because he was not only kind, but sensible. We called him the governor. And life opened out on holidays abroad, to Germany, to Switzerland. Museums, practical jokes, mostly mine, appreciated so by Ethel. A long idyll of hotel life is how I remembered it, which ended when it was time to make me a man. Ethel, dear Ethel, wanted me ever to remain her darling boy. She was constantly telling me, and indeed almost anyone she came across, how youthful I was. I must tell you that it is Ethel who is responsible for much of my mystery. Dear Ethel, who appointed herself Keeper of the Flame. A flame in which she destroyed any letter from me in which I was indiscreet about myself. Dear Ethel, whose memoir shows me to be quite perfect. When they grew up, it became very clear that Ethel was not going to marry. She was, for whatever reason, not marriageable. And Saki realized he was going to have to take care of her for the rest of their lives. Ethel came to worship Hector. There's absolutely no doubt that he was her favorite. In the one photograph we have of them, he's looking at the camera and she's staring up adoringly at him. Poor old Ethel. I mean, what is it with the sisters? How Hector saw Ethel is a different matter. It's quite hard to know, quite hard to judge, but I think she may have cramped his style somewhat. It could be said that I did all the work myself during that famous interview. My favourite flower is the periwinkle. My favourite animal is the kingfisher. My favourite bird is the hedge sparrow. And I like oysters, asparagus and politics, also the theatre. You, you have written for the theatre? Yes, but I've not yet had anything produced. Personally, I don't believe I ever will, but you know how difficult it is to get a drama by a new man accepted. It is surprising, for you have great gifts for writing dialogue. So it's said. 